Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Welcome to my online classroom with the Maple League of Universities. Um, if you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat, and please note that today's session is recorded. Um, so if you would like to stay away from being part of the online recording, you can turn off your audio and video and participate via the chat. I will now hand it over to Dr. Jessica Riddell to introduce our speaker for today. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to our Maple League virtual teaching and learning center series on welcome to my online classroom. And today it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jasmine Sidhu, who is going to take us through uh, her classroom and um, give us uh, some insights into uh, what she's used, how she is connected with her students, what technology and platforms she's used to uh, increase student engagement. And I'm just so excited to to welcome um, uh, my friend and collaborator. She is one of the most courageous uh, and brave and thoughtful educators that I have encountered. Um, she is rigorous and challenging, but she's also playful and understands that delight um, and joy is an entry into transformative education. So she meets students where they are and uses platforms like TikTok and Instagram, as well as the more traditional platforms in order to keep things relevant and fresh. Uh, her students consistently report that they are challenged and transformed and have really high expectations for themselves and work through this co-design with Dr. Sidhu. Um, I can tell you that uh, she is a relatively new faculty member at Bishops in the psychology department. Uh, she's a neuroscientist. And last year, in her first year of teaching, uh, we, we went through the teaching award process, the teaching award selection process, which was a group of um, 10 students and three faculty members. And we sat on this selection committee. And Jasmine was, was nominated several times by a number of groups of students. And we were so compelled by her presence and her thought and her innovation that we created an award for her because of her, because of the tremendous impact that she had on her department and on the institution. So we created the Rising Star Award to mark a space and to make visible and value the work that she is doing. And so it is just a pleasure to be here today to get a peek into her virtual classroom. And I'm really looking forward to getting some ideas and creative juices flowing in advance of winter 2021. So please um, join me in welcoming Jasmine um, for a look uh, into the into the looking glass as we go down a, a what I think is going to be a really exciting rabbit hole. So take it away. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. It's incredibly moving. I super appreciate that uh, to even consider on that level of esteem. It's very kind of you. Um, so I'm here to introduce you to my classroom. I'm just so happy that you guys are here. And it's a little bit of a casual environment because I'm a little bit of a casual kind of person. But to be honest, when I was approached to do the virtual classroom, I was kind of like, no problem. I'll show you what I do. But it was a really great ex exercise because I had to think about, well, what do I want to say to you? What was the overall goal of the way I structured my classroom? And at the time, I was watching the Netflix series um, about the playbook, about coaches' guides to living life. Uh, it was an incredible series. And so I kind of copied Netflix a little bit. I'm sure I'm not going to get a copyright violation. They don't care about me, I don't think. But this is the lesson book. My overall goal for my students is to have student academic success with STEM-based material using an online delivery platform. And that sounds pretty basic, but when you start to think about it, it becomes a little bit hard. So I want to take you through what I did to try and achieve this goal. So the first step is to know your audience, right? So say you can really have two types of students. You can have a student who wants to be in your class, and you can have a student who needs to be in your class. And I apologize for, your write, for the writing. But they're very different, right? If a student comes into your class and they want to be in your class, half the battle is already won. They already love either the material or your teaching style. They're there to open and they're there to be engaged. But if a student needs to be in your class, 
<laughs> if a student needs to be in your class, it's because they maybe need to fulfill a prerequisite. And here, what you might be dealing with is really fear or apathy, right? You might be dealing with a student's own fear or own apathy of the course material. They could be thinking of themselves saying, oh, I'm not a scientist. I'm just here to fulfill a credit. I'm just here to pass. There's a lot of biases you have to overcome if you're that course. If you're that STEM course, that's the prerequisite. So the first thing to assess, number one, is who is your audience? Who are your students? And the way I decided to tackle this problem in my courses was to do a pre-course questionnaire. So from a pre-course questionnaire, it's a super basic methodology, but you get an intuition of the major, the year, the prerequisites. And you can also do a little bit of fancier things, get an idea of how comfortable they are with certain concepts, where you need to start, get an idea of what were the most meaningful courses or what even they hope to get out of the course. And so before you even started, you have a kind of an intuition of what these students are feeling and if they're anxious to enter. But then the next goal is to change that fear and empathy. Okay, you've identified it. And usually I'm a prerequisite course, so I usually have a lot of students that need to be in my class versus want to be in my class. So I want to change that fear and apathy of the material into love. You want them to love your material. You want them to have a great educational experience where they come out feeling transformed because you wouldn't be teaching it if you didn't love that material in general. So here, what really the goal becomes is to transform this into love, right? How are we going to do that? For me, this was a thought process. What do I need to do to generate love? And you just think about your relationships in the world. And the ones that are most meaningful are the ones where you truly feel in partnership. So the goal is to create a partnership, an educational partnership with the student, especially with the student that needs to be there. This can be applied to the student who also like wants to be there, but especially for the student that needs to be there. So how am I going to do that? And this relates into my next three rules for giving a good class, a STEM-based class, where you could have student academic success. So my rule number two is give control to get consent. A student is forced to be there if you're a prerequisite class. The low side of control for choosing that material is beyond them, and for even having it in their schedule is beyond them. So before they've even entered, you're dealing uh, with a negative bias. You're dealing with their internal and external biases, and you're thinking to yourself, or they're thinking to themselves, things like, I'm not a scientist, I don't think like that, I'm just here to pass, whatever. They have no sense of ownership over the course. And they don't really, they haven't really consented to be. So a concept is to give control over some aspect of the course to get consent to teach them. And so the way I garner that consent is through evaluation. I can't really change the material I have to teach, but I can modify the way they're evaluated so they have a say. In this way, we're moving towards an educational goal together. So, in the evaluation. So what I mean is, in my courses, and this was inspired by a, a colleague of mine too who does this, that in my courses, I allow the student to have 60% uh, optional grading criteria. And what I mean is they have high value and low value options that they can choose then to format their grade. 40% is a mandatory final, so I know that they needed to learn what they needed to learn in the course. But the rest of it and the rest of these options are flexible options. And so sometimes you can have a student who will learn how to play to their strength. And by doing this, you've moved that low side of control that was external internally into that student. Now they have a say, they have skin in the game. So now the only battle is the content. It's not necessarily the evaluation. And they know strategically that they can, if they can master the content in a way that you know, plays to their strengths, they will come out of this course getting a good mark. So here, when I start a creative partnership, 
I'm really thinking about giving control to get consent, consent to teach, consent to have an open mind, consent to start an educational partnership. And I just want you to note that uh, this is really paired with the way your evaluation method and course setup can be. So on the outset, if you just tell them that this is happening and you illustrate to them the way it works, it really shows them the scope. It shows them the scope of how much impact they can have. So for example, this is just an, a snapshot from my course syllabus, and this is the way my Moodle is set up. So right away, they know the weightings, they know the options, the drop boxes are open, uh, sorry, the submission boxes are open. Everything is set up. They understand this is their material, this is what they can choose to engage in, and these are the activities. So they're really accompanying each other. Something that I quite like about this idea, this idea of flexibility and options, is that it allows you to be creative in what you can assign to. So I have a few options, as Jessica mentioned, involving social media, because social media and learning on social media is quite powerful. Khan Academy, a crash course on YouTube, learn on TikTok. They're one of the most mobilized pedagogical sources that we have of information that are teaching most like larger student audiences than we could ever have access to. So learning how to think in a thoughtful way on social media using these types of apps, you are actually training a student to be engaged in what the current dialogue is. So one of the assignments I give is for a percentage of marks, I'll allow a student to create five TikTok teaching style videos. And it allows your student to become creative too. So this is an example of a student. Welcome to my life as a memory. So I start out by being a sensor information, copied into the sensor memory, which register all other senses. And it can only limited sensor information. But if one is further in the memory and start the encoding process, then I'm going to move to the short-term memory, where the encoding process will start the labeling and coding sensor information that's organized contextually with similar concepts. But it can only hold seven little chunks, so if one is stayed, then I need to be encoded through online processing or rehearsal. And if I'm rehearsed enough, then I can move to the long-term memory, where I can stay forever, like my lifespan, but if I need to be retrieved for some reason, then I can go back to the short-term memory uh, through a free recall, kills recall, or a serial recall. And I can encode it back, and retrieve back, and encode it back, for, and stay here forever until I'm forgotten. So that's like an extremely effective video. In a minute, she went through a really traditional memory structure, talked about the limitations about it, and really informatively told me about the key aspects. It is a high level of information that's been synthesized into a one minute video. And I think this is very clever and a great skill to start being able to transmit to the students. So for myself in my courses with these optional criteria, I'm able to emphasize what I call uh, real world transposable skills. Things that are they are currently being engaged in and that they can learn to do effectively for future jobs. Uh, in your courses, I encourage you to consider that too. What are some optional criteria that you could have? So I'm creating this partnership. I'm creating this consent-based partnership of giving them options, giving them a variety of options that play to their strengths so that they can then start the process of learning instead of being forced to learn something. And that comes to rule number three. So rule number two was more about getting their consent. Okay, they're engaged, we're creating a partnership. So you jump the hurdle of their open-mindedness, but you still have the hurdle of the material. And I'm not gonna knock STEM-based courses. I mean, science is amazing, but sometimes the material is heavy and it can be very difficult. So this comes to my, set, my third point, my third rule. It's the power of transformation. Transform your material. Transform it live in front of the uh, in front of the student. So transform. I should go transform material. And what do I mean by that? In a traditional STEM course, usually I'm in neuroscience, biologically oriented courses. You'll have like a slide deck, and you'll have these slides, and you're going to just sit there and you're going to lecture. This is a classic passive lecture technique. I have these slides prepared, I'm going to talk to you about them. That, that's, and that's a valid way, that's, a, that's the traditional way I was taught. 
Yeah, at some point you could even add an active mode where a teacher will zoom in on a slide and say, ask you a particular question about the material. And this is incredibly useful because it shows live pictures of real biological processes or live impressions that we have seen now and we have the technology to see that helps with comprehension. So this is a really useful thing to do, to have a slide deck to illustrate real life examples and to ask specific questions. But it's heavy. It is concept heavy. If we even just go back and reflect, each one of these anatomical drawings creates heaviness. Uh, it creates a lot of material you're covering. So what I like to do is I like to transform that material. I like to transform it to make the content more digestible and to aid in this partnership that I'm entering with the student. So I transform the material into concept, uh, concept maps or workflows. So I tend to do a passive or active 15 to 20 minute review at the beginning of a class where I go over material. And I do this for really four reasons. To make a complex concept simpler. So I'm really modeling V1 tissues here. That's me like leaning down to right. So you can tell from this lecture even that I lean down to right. Uh, it contextualizes the position for the coming, uh, coming lecture. It also does a review of the main points when the student's attention is at its peak, when they're having sustained attention. And I teach the skill of concept breakdown by example. This is an example of a histological slice of tissue but I've broken it down in a really digestible way. So now when the student goes to study, perhaps they can learn these breakdown and learn how to apply these skills. And it's actually something that I ask them to do. Concept map and workflow generations is one of my options. So it starts to make this heavy lead-like material really light and airy like gold. And I just want to say that I also have active options within these reviews. And I have a few tips for this too. So, I have an active option in the reviews where sometimes I'll throw out, I'll ask, can you start labeling this to me? And if the answer is definitive, if there is a real right answer, I always ask it to a group because there's still a social context online about not wanting to be wrong and not wanting to look foolish. There's that really famous quote, better to be assumed half a fool, half a fool than to look to, than it to be known. Um, so, Oftentimes, if I give a, a very direct question and I ask for a very direct answer on the slide deck, like that classic example of active participation, I'm gonna get silence because nobody wants to be technically wrong. But if you make it a group generation effort, it also helps facilitate a light environment. So I'm going to start one of this videos here of where I'm doing a group generation no, effort. My older stuff. This one, it has a lot of small blue lights coming in. Does anybody remember what type of light blue cells? Many yes. blue cones will connect it. So watch the top. Oh, Perfect. I'm getting comments. They're starting to fill in okay. the answers here. And does anybody remember with this connection from one cone direct? One cone direct. So excellent job, you guys. I'm seeing S cone pop up. Perfect, perfect. Excellent. Yes. Midget. What's this? Right? And so diffuse hemorrhage will converge to the same ganglial cell. Does anybody remember what this retinal ganglial cell? So this might be a little bit hard. Parallel. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Beautiful, you guys. Beautiful. And then does anybody remember what the S cone? So you could theoretically have more S cone bipolar cells. Uh, what retinal ganglial cell type it connects to? Small by stratified. It's just how you are. That's kind of Michelin and Keisha. You guys are merging it to the SL side. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Can you move in? Good job. Good job. And Jasmine. Good job, guys. Okay, perfect. All right. So, yes, you have small by stratified. And you see, if you saw the last pop up, it might have been difficult to see with your setup. The last pop up was a student saying, Get it, gang. You're starting to create an interactive environment online that's really positive and beneficial for learning. The students are engaging with each other in a collaborative way, in a happy way, and there's no dead space in your lecture. So it's really less pressure on a pointed question. It becomes a group generation event, which allows them to learn the material, and it allows you to create a light, airy uh, environment around a really technical material. This is retinal layer processing, and it's quite technical. They had labeled all the layers anatomically and we're starting to go through the process of the biochemical processes of how it works.
I would say that if you want to ask a direct question to a particular student or to emphasize, to get some engagement, if you've been noticing their engagement metrics are down, ask a subjective question, one that does not have a definitive answer. This will allow the students to feel more comfortable in expressing their opinions and feel less judged. So this is an example of a subjective question. It's about mental cognitive maps and the perception of how you know where you are in the brain. So Daphne, could you come on the audio? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, excellent. So I'm gonna ask you, imagine yourself on Bishop's University campus. Imagine you're at the sports center, right? You're gonna go to the library, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you plan that route in your head? Yeah. Okay, describe the route you would take. The library? Um, so if I'm coming out of the sportsplex, I walk whatever direction that is in like a D direction, walk all the way straight um, and go where that um, building on the left is like that, uh, the old sportsplex. Um, and there's that table where all the security guards usually smoke at. And then you keep walking and on the right hand, you have the like security little building, you have that stop sign, and then you can continue on kind of a beard left straight right to the library. That's what I do. Excellent. And something that happened right after that moment, when I just asked for an opinion, another student volunteered their opinion of how they would do it and how it was different, thereby helping prove my point that mental maps are not stable in individuals perceptively. So if you're starting to ask pointed questions, make sure to a particular individual, I would try and make them subjective. And the idea is that it makes STEM-based material fun. It becomes collaborative. We're making a partnership. We're, tra we're transforming those heavy lead-like slides into really active, engaged, broken down, digestible concepts. So you can make STEM fun. And I just wanna say STEM is fun. Like nothing makes more sense than STEM, okay? <laughs> like, so like, you know, science is great. It tells us everything we need to know. So it makes STEM fun, right? It is fun, but it just illustrates to the students. So how effective is this? How effective is this technique? So I haven't reached the end of the term yet, and these are actually uh, metrics from earlier. But these are my engagements, my replies for only classes, so when it's live. So we're only for the hour and a half, so it's probably about uh, 18 uh, lessons or 17 lessons here. And I have 40 students in this class, 65 and 65 in this class. And you can see my metrics. For neuropsychology, actually, I had two guest lectures, so I couldn't record the replies. But you could see that for one class for neuropsychology, it's 1,300 engagements that I have just in class for over the 18 lectures. For cognition, I have close to 1,800 engagements. That's in the 18 lectures for about 60 students. So on average, obviously, you have some students that are not attending, that are not digesting material this and this way, but you have about two engagements on average per class per student. And here I have 1800 in perception and I have 40 individuals in this course. So here I have about three, in, three interactions per class per individual. So these metrics still need to be disentangled. I still need to look at them more deeply and I'm gonna do that at the end of this year. But how good is this at fostering a nice, light, interactive learning environment online? which is really a, ch a challenge, right? The name of the game is engagement in online learning. So how good was it? So I personally really rely on it a lot and I'm seeing some good uh, outcomes here. But then this leads me to my fourth rule. You know, I mentioned it, I alluded to it. Some students like to engage in the material this way and some students don't. And so I really have this idea, let a student be them. Let them be them. And what do I mean by that? I mean something that I learned through a reflection. Uh, Jack Sto Shostak is a Nobel Prize winning uh, educator, or he's a professor, a doctor, and he did a lot of good work in biochemistry, a real technical STEM-based skill, and he did his undergrad at McGill. And he came to Sherbrooke a few years ago and I was super excited because he's working on astrobiology and the creation of the universe. So it's very interesting to me, very, very sciencey and like about the world and the universe. So I was super excited, I was super pumped. I went to his lecture and someone asked him about his undergrad education. And he goes, honestly, I never attended lecture. It just wasn't the way I thought. I would go to the library and I would read. 
and uh, I would read the material and I would learn it passively. And I remember just thinking, wow, this guy never attended a single structured lecture in his own undergrad at McGill, which he paid to attend, and he won the Nobel Prize. He mastered his material to a degree no one else, probably not even his professors mastered it. We have this impression that students who don't attend the classes are at-risk students or poor students. But what Jack Shostak's story says, and it's a leading story, it's one with cognitive biases, but what it says to me is that some students are better learners in an asynchronous, non-engaged method. And I want to facilitate learning for them too. I don't want to be biased that I only facilitate learning with the students who just come, who just, but who come to class. Students learn in different ways. Some want a passive partnership. They just want the material there. They want a good structure. They want to be able to see everything that they want to see. Some want to have high levels of engagement. They even want more of your attention outside of class time. So you're dealing with this range, really, of students. And the goal for me is to support them all. I'm not going to preferentialize one group. So I want to create a partnership that really maximizes their own individual educational identity. So I want to create a passive partnership for the underdog, what we view as the traditional underdog in educational research or educational, you know, uh, thoughts. <laughs> like, and the one that doesn't come to class, that individual. I want to create a passive partnership for them because to be honest, who am I to know about what's going on in their life? Who am I to know what limitations they have that makes it difficult for them to come and even though they cannot come perhaps they have still chosen to educate themselves to better their lives so i set up my courses to be able to be passive and active what i mean by that is that they can be followed asynchronously or they can be followed synchronously and with the addition of something to help those overly engaged or those really engaged students and that's the creation of study groups. So, oh, so active. So in the middle is that normal engagement. So I'm going to illustrate what that means. So here, this is what I mean by passive partnership. Right at the top of my page, I have recorded lectures. A student can click, all my lectures are available. They can consume it at their time. I make very clear what's testable in a guest lecture or non-testable, and I take it through and I organize it. The course itself, they know the drop boxes, they know the, the limitations, the, all the late policies are put on to the Moodle. They know how to access all the materials. Right from the start of the course, everything is available to them. I don't think I'm overloading the student because we live in a society where information is readily available at the fingertips of an individual. We have organizations like Khan Academy that put out entire years of educational material and still have high levels of engagement. So I think from the outset, if they know what is to be covered, they're able to plan their time accordingly and adjust because that is what modern education looks like. That is what modern pedagogical sites are telling us and illustrating to us. So I support those passive students by making sure my content can be consumed this way, making sure the deadlines that are internal are very clear from the start of the lecture or from the start of the course and trying to facilitate you know, learning. For active students, ones that want even more engagement with, them, with me, with the material, I give it to them for this through optional study groups. So I have study groups that students can self-sort themselves into. So here's an example. They can sort themselves into a study group here. They can self-sort themselves into a study group. It happens bi-weekly throughout the term. There's a maximum of 10 people per study group to get that level of engagement and mentorship they crave. And I sort them and give them a schedule. And then I facilitate four study groups a week outside of my lecture hours. This is to give guidance for those individuals who want more guidance, who need more engagement, who need to be drawn in that way. As such, I'm supporting the range. Because if I want to create a partnership, you know, every partner you've ever had in any type of pursuit, educational, uh, career oriented, or even romantic, it comes with the understanding that they're not the same as someone else. And the student is the same. 
the educational partnership is very important to understand that they are different individuals who are consuming things differently. So that's my rule number four. And this brings me to my absolute last rule. Have a safety net. <laughs> like Sometimes there's going to be students that are going to slip through the cracks and there's going to be someone who nothing you're doing is going to work for them. And so my rule number five is to have a safety net. So I do traditional things, like there's classic safety nets. I record the lectures through Teams, which, I, which is the platform which I give lectures. I give very clear study guides for midterms and exams, so my objectives for courses are pretty clear, and they can work through them as exercises. But what else could I do? And this, for me, was really the use of social media. With technical materials, it's unlikely that a student will master the material on the first pass. So I have a heavy lecture. I have the lecture, I have the deep dive of the material. Then I have a slightly lighter version where it's interactive, where I'm breaking down the concept from the slide deck into these interactive transformative experiences in the first 20 minutes of class. And sometimes I do carry out that concept throughout class. You know, these transformative uh, engagement exercises. I, I think there's real utility in writing it slows down the pace of a class to make it digestible to the student. Now you're not covering 30 anatomical concepts, you're covering what you're constrained to write about. So I had this digestion. And the last safety net digestion is one of micro lectures. So for my courses, I create four to seven minute micro lectures of all the concepts we covered. So if a student is having difficulty accessing their platforms, accessing Moodle or having difficulty finding time to sit down for a block of time to watch something, they have little four to seven minute lectures that go over main concepts of material. And I'll just illustrate that to you. This is my perception course. I have about 81 posts, 81 videos, uh, small micro lecture videos for supporting my content. So if I go to say my Instagram series, I'm talking about emotional contagion, I go through and I have different, different types of videos for different concepts all the way through. And so some of you might be thinking, is this a useful exercise? How good, how much does this support the student? It seems like a lot of work on the outset with these four to seven minute micro lectures, which would, again adds another layer of review. So you have the hour that's interactive in class, you have the 20 minutes at the beginning of class, and then you have these passive ones or these ones they can engage in on their phone outside of class time. These layered uh, time constraints of the same content to help them review, how effective are they? Well, I'll just show you how many views I have of some of the key lectures. So on the more difficult concepts for perception, I have easily over 100 views or about 100 views. So I have for Route 2 and Emotional Contagion, I have 156. For on and off center bipolar cell processing, I have 118. Retinal layers, 101. So you can see that students are accessing these resources to help underpin their activity and their active learning. So these were my rules. These, this is my playbook, essentially. Know my audience, create a partnership by giving control to get consent, by transforming that heavy lead like material, transmutation to gold-like consumable uh, objects, uh, to creating that you know, information uh, to be digested passively or actively because you're letting a student be them and having a safety net. And that's what I applied for the way I think about a course, the way I could get academic success on an online model or you know, organization <laughs> for giving courses uh, for STEM-based lectures. So to do that, what I did is I just partnered my Moodle with my Teams and my Instagram platforms to reach those goals. So what my online classroom looks like is something to facilitate those goals. So I give you a glimpse of my Moodle. The Teams is just exactly like I'm showing you now, just like I showed you in those videos. It's a platform where all the students know to meet and the easy access going to where the student is giving them the material that's easily accessible and digestible on their phone is on social media. 
So that's kind of my story right now. That's, that's the lesson book that I've closed. I still have a lot to learn and I don't have the answers. And I'm still creating metrics to really see how well all these things performed and how much they help support my student. But it's a place to start because I truly believe that our educational model is a bit outdated. Uh, we learn like, we teach like it was 250 years ago. And I think with the changing structure of the world, we don't even look like we did 10 years ago. So why do our classrooms look so old? And that's kind of it for me, but I'm really open to questions and to comments. So uh, thank you for your time and for your engagement.